Uh, as you would have probably noted, the technology got the better of me in uh, two of the lectures. So apparently after you start sharing your screen, you need to click that button every time you move between programs. Um, I've now learned that the hard way and it will hopefully not happen again. So in this lecture, I'm just going to do the two Excel sheets. So the second part of lecture three, bank reconciliations, and the second part of lecture four on financial statements. So basically the two teaching examples. Okay, so now I'm going to hopefully get it right and go share screen. Okay. So this is our training example for bank reconciliations. Just going to make this a little bit smaller so that we can get that last part in there. Okay, so let's get straight into it. My first transaction, so just to explain to you what I've done here, this is my supplementary cash book. So this is in effect the account. It's got a debit side and it's got a credit side. So I'm going to enter all of the details on the left hand side here and then you guys will be able to see whether it's a debit or whether it's a credit. OK, so let's look at the first one. Our cash book balance as at 31 January 2020. So that basically means that's our opening balance for our cash book. So somewhere up there, we would have had a whole lot of transactions and those transactions would have given me a total and that's now my total or my starting balance for my new ledger and it's a positive amount so because it's a positive amount i'm going to enter that on the debit side then it says my trust bank statement balance on the 29th of february is 340 rand so what i've done here is i've got my cash book so we're going to handle a whole lot of transactions on the debit and the credit side. And I've set up a formula here to work out the balance of my cash book the whole time. Then when that cash book balance carries forward into my bank reconciliation, we'll add some transactions, we'll deduct some transactions, and the program will work out the closing balance of my bank recon. Now what we know we want to do is we want to start with our cash book balance and we want to end with our bank statement balance. So I'm going to enter my bank statement balance over there and then just put a little formula in to see whether I've got a difference. So what we're aiming at is at the end of this example, that difference there will be zero. So my trust bank statement balance, I go and I write that in at the bottom of my bank reconciliation. So if you're not doing it in Excel, you guys can type that amount in there on that block there when you're doing your actual assignment. I'm just doing it in this manner so that you can see what I'm trying to reconcile. OK, um, oh yeah, just a note on the actual assignment. These two lines are basically in there. If you enter, so the bank reconciliation on its own is only five marks. So if you enter that line there, and that line there, which was basically two givens in the assignment, that's already two of the marks. So the really difficult stuff only amounts to three points on the bank reconciliation. But in any case, let's try and get those three points as well. OK, so now we start with the first one. The following receipts were on the TCB, but not on the bank statement. So that means all these transactions have been accounted for somewhere in my original cash book up there and now they have not yet appeared on our bank statement so we need to so those transactions we need to analyze and see are they reconciling will they still happen in future then we add them on that side and if they're not reconciling then we'll have to either enter or reverse them into the cash book so let's first see on the 6th of February 2020, we receive a proof of payment from a client for 300 Rand. Okay, so the moment we receive that proof of payment up here in my first cash book, in my original cash book, I would have entered a debit transaction 
for 300 Rand. So that 300 Rand is already contained in that opening balance over there. Now we've got to ask ourselves, will this transaction still happen in future? Now, if this was a check, I'd potentially say yes. But if someone sends you EFT proof of payment on the 6th of February, and we're doing this bank reconciliation on the 29th of Feb, that's more than three weeks. So if a EFT transaction does not clear in three weeks, I reckon that transaction will never happen in future. So if a transaction will never happen in future, we can't put it on the bank recon because the bank recon tells us what will happen in future. So that means we have to reverse that transaction in our cash book. So we'll say reverse false receipt. Okay, and how do we reverse? We originally posted it on the debit side as a receipt because it's money coming in. So to reverse that, will enter that into the credit side of my bank T account. Okay, so now if we see my balance there would have updated itself, updated itself, updated itself, but we still have a difference, so we've got to go on. Okay, now the next one. Check or receipt number two, which is a check. So I've specifically, specifically written in there, it will clear because if someone pays you with a check on the 25th of the month and that gets banked, it takes between 10 and 14 days for that check to clear. So at this month end, I think there's no reason to believe that that check will not happen in future. At the end of March, that will ever be a different story. Okay, but at this stage, we're just at the end of Feb. So originally we would have captured it as a receipt on the debit side somewhere in my original cash book up there now i believe that this transaction will still happen in future so that means i have to add that to my bank reconciliation so i'm going to say receipt number two and now the question is do we plus that or do we minus that so if we go back to our original rules that we had the rule was deduct outstanding deposits so that's going to be a minus 300 rand and you can actually write in there less receipt number two right then we get to the next one a cash receipt on the 28th of feb 2020 for 100 Rand. So what happens the moment your client walks in there and he gives you the 100 Rand, you would have entered that as a receipt on the debit side of your cash book. Now we've got to ask ourselves, will that 100 Rand still be banked in future? So what's the rule is we've got two business days to go and bank that. So one day later, we have no reason to believe that that receipt won't be banked on the 1st or the 2nd of March. So I'm not going to reverse it. I'm going to put it in my bank reconciliation because I believe it will still happen in future. So is cash deposit and minus 100 rand. Okay, so that is that for number three for receipt. So just remember the rule. If it's a receipt and I believe it will still pass through my bank statement in future, then we deduct it. But if it is a, we believe it won't happen in future, then we're gonna go and reverse the effect in our cash book. Okay, so now let's move on to checks. So these are now payments. So check number one dated the 28th of May, 2019. And I've written there, this check has now become stale. So for the last six months, that check would have been a reconciling item on my bank recon. But as at the end of Feb, do we believe that check will still be able to be banked? And the answer is no, because now it's gone stale. So when we originally wrote the check, signed it and gave it to the client, we would have written that check onto the credit side of our supplementary cash book, uh, of our normal cash book. So to reverse the effect of that check, 
we now have to go and debit that. And we will say reverse stale check. Okay. Then let's look at the next one. Check number three dated the 26th of Feb. So three days before our month end, we gave a check to client. Do we believe that the client will still bank it in future? And the answer is yes, we do believe they will still bank it in future. And we will believe that for the next six months until that check then becomes stale. So check number three, we are then going to add to our bank reconciliation. So we will say add check number three and we will add 300 rand over there. Okay, so at this point, still we do not reconcile, but we are getting there. There's still more info that we need to analyze. Okay, now we get to the two hair raising ones, the bank errors. So I've written that little template that I explained in the lecture on the side here. So we're going to use that and hopefully that will guide us to get an answer. So the bank incorrectly credited my trust bank with a business deposit of 400 Rand. Okay, so now let's see. First thing that we know is this is a bank error because it specifically says the bank incorrectly. So already we know it's a reconciling item on our bank recon. So we'll enter their bank error. Now the question is, do we plus or do we minus 400 Rand? So let's go and take the long road. Now it says the bank incorrectly credited my trust bank with a business deposit. So that means this is truly a business deposit. So will I have an entry in my cash book reflecting this deposit? And the answer is no, I'm not going to make my records incorrect because the bank made an error. So in my trust cash book, I will have no entry for this. That means my trust cash book balance will be zero. Zero will carry over onto my bank recon as my opening cash book balance. This is the only transaction in the world. What will my bank statement balance be? So it says the bank accidentally or incorrectly put this money into my trust bank. So my, on my actual bank statement, my balance will be 400 Rand. So if we then fill in the missing gap there to say, how do we get from zero to a positive 400? The answer is plus. So in this case, we are going to say, add bank error to the value of 400 Rand. This one you might need to rewind and watch this again two or three times before it will make sense. Okay, then we get to number six. A business check was banked and deducted from my trust bank in error. So immediately, what do we know? If it was a business bank check, but it went off my trust account, that is a bank error. So again, we know we're going to go to our bank recon because it is something that will happen in future. The bank will fix this in future. So let's start. A business check was banked. So will I have any entry for this in my trust cash book? And the answer is no. I'm not going to make my records incorrect because of the bank error. So my trust cash book will have a zero balance. The zero balance will carry over into my cash book there. And if this is the only transaction in the world that happened, if there's no other transactions and the bank went and took a business check off my trust bank, what will my trust bank balance be? The answer is a negative 250 Rand. So my trust bank will be an overdraft of 250 Rand. So how do I get from zero to a negative 250? And the answer is minus 250. So the answer to line number six would be to say deduct or less bank error. And 
we minus 250 rand. Okay, so the answer to this, as you can see, there is no general rule in terms of bank errors. We can't say it's always a plus or minus. We'll have to look at the example and pop it into this little schedule of ours, and this little schedule will give us the answer on whether it's a plus or a minus. Okay, then we get to number seven. Trust interest of 200 Rand was received and trust bank charges of 400 Rand paid. So let's think for a moment, will we add that to our supplementary cash book? Has it been added somewhere in our original cash book? Or is that a bank reconciling item? So let's work it in reverse and say, what is the definition of a bank reconciling item? The answer is, it is something that will pass through my bank account in future. Now, will this happen in future? The answer is no, it has already happened. It's already in my bank account. So that means I can't put it as a bank reconciling item. Okay. And then the way that this question is structured, the interest was received and trust bank charges of 400 rand paid. Now, what we're trying to say here is it has never, this is new information that we haven't yet accounted for. You'll see in the assignment, they very specifically say this is a list of uh, transactions that has not yet been accounted for. So in this case, those two transactions have never been accounted for up there in my original cash book. So because it has already happened, my cash book is now incorrect. So I need to update my cash book for these transactions that happened. So I'm going to say trust interest bank charges. So interest will increase my bank account and bank charges will have a negative effect on my bank account. My formula is wrong there. Okay. I've already set this formula to deduct my credit side, just so that you could see, so I don't have to enter a minus on my supplementary cash book. Okay, so the reason we add that to our cash book is it is actual transactions that has already happened, and there's no way without capturing that my accounting records would be incorrect. And then we get to check number five, payment of 120 Rand was captured as 210 Rand. So that means we made an error because the actual payment was 120 Rand, but we captured it as 210. So that means in my original cash book up there, I had entry on the credit side to the value of 210 Rand. So what's the rule when it's our mistake, if it's our error, we have to correct our accounting records. So how will we do that? First, we are going to reverse the error. So if it was originally captured on the credit side, to correct that, I'm going to enter a debit of the same value. But now I've only reversed the incorrect entry. I haven't actually accounted for the transaction itself. So I'm going to add a line and say check number five. And the correct value is it should have been a credit of 120 Rand. OK, so now let's have a look at that. So I've got my cash book balance brought forward. I've reversed my deposits that won't happen in future. I've reversed my checks that will not be able to be banked in future. I've accounted for all transactions that I didn't know about. Now, these two are actually very important because almost all of the transactions in the assignment are these transactions. And they, this portion of it counts a large amount. This portion is the portion that's only five marks, but there's a whole lot of marks for accounting for the transactions that hasn't been accounted for. Okay, and then if I made errors or the accountant make errors, we fix those errors in our supplementary cash book. Then we have a closing cash book balance of 290 Rand. 
but I've got a closing bank statement balance of 340 Rand. So that's why I have to draft this bank reconciliation to tell the users of my financial statements why there's a difference between my statement balance and my cash book balance. And that's given here. So we start with our cash book balance, less our receipts that will still happen in future. We add back our checks that we believe will be banked in future or could still be banked in future. And then we fix any errors made by the bank. And if you then total all of that, I get a closing bank statement balance of 340 Rand. And we know that we reconcile. Okay, so again, the most important part in the assignment is capturing the missing transactions. This part, which is the difficult part, is only three marks. Okay, so that is that in terms of the bank reconciliation question. So now I just want to get this sharing thing ready again and say that we now have to share our other example, which is the financial statements example. And this time I'll also be clever and actually check that it reflects before sending it off to you guys. Right, so... This is the training example for our financial statements. So what I've given you here is a trial balance, which we've discussed in the lecture part. So the trial balance is simply a summary of all of my little T ledger accounts and whether they have a debit or a credit closing balance. And now for each of these accounts, I'm going to take them and assess them against that little table there. And so if it's a debit balance, it means it's either an asset or an expense. If it's an asset, it means I will either be able to use this for a long time or I will in future receive money because of it. And if it's an expense, it means money's out my bank, I'm never getting anything back for it. If the transaction is on the credit side, so in those columns there, then it means we've got to assess it against those two possibilities to say it's either a liability or it is income. So liability means in future I will have an outflow of money because of this or if people give me money and I don't have to give it back to them that means I've generated income. Okay so we're first going to put every each transaction against that little table there and then once we've determined something is an asset, expense, liability or income then we're either going to decide whether we're going to put it into the income statement or we're going to put it into our balance sheet. Right. Let's look at the first one. So the first one says bank charges and it has got a debit balance of 4,000 Rand. So that means we are going to explore those two options there. So when the bank charges you for using your bank account, Will you in future receive money because of that or will they give it to you back to you? No chance. The money that the, the moment that money goes out of your bank, that will be a expense. So I'm going to come to my expense section. I'm going to put the bank charges and the amount is 4,000 Rand. Now you'll see I've already set up a formula to say my net profit is my income less my expenses. So at this point, I've made a loss of 4,000 Rand. Let's look at the next one, business bank account. So in terms of my business bank account, that has got a credit closing balance of 5,023. Right, so that means we are looking at the credit side or the two credit options. Now my business bank account, if that is a credit balance, that means my bank account has gone into overdraft. Because remember, a bank account is always either an asset if it's on the debit side or a liability on the credit side. The reason why it's a liability is because if we close up shop today, me as the shareholder will have to put all of the monies that the business owes in the overdraft. I'll have to put that in. So that's why it's classified as a liability. The shareholder will in future have to put that money back into the business. 
If the bank were to come to us and say, listen, we're going to write off your overdraft, we don't care, you never have to pay it back, yes, in that case, we can move that to income. But at this point, it's a liability. So now we've got to decide, is it a non-current liability or a current liability? Now, all trading assets will always be classified as current liabilities, as in there will be movement on it on a daily basis or within the next month. It's only fund liabilities that we will take more than a year to pay, which will be classified as non-current. So under current liabilities, I'm going to put business bank account and the amount is 5023. Okay, so in yeah, just so that you can see, I've got a formula to say add all my assets and or add all my equity and liabilities. And then I will be able to see whether I balance. So if I made a mistake somewhere, this section won't balance. Then we've got shareholder loan. That's got a credit balance. So that means it's either a liability or income. Now, if the shareholder made a loan to the business, and they will have to pay, the business will have to pay that back to them in future. Now, your shareholder loan is also normally almost like a trading liability because you'll put money into the business, draw money from the business the whole time. So for that reason, our shareholder loan will be a current liability. Ten thousand rand. If you've specifically made a contract or drafted a contract with a business to say that this loan will not be repayable in the next five or ten years. Then you can move the shareholders loan into your non-current liabilities. But in general and in practice, we show that shareholders loan as a current liability. Okay, now we've got cash on hand, 4,000 Rand and some cents. That's got a debit balance. So that means it's either an asset or a expense. So let's think if I close up shop today, will the shareholder be able to go into the little petty cash box and take that cash? And the answer is yes. So because in future, the owner of this business will be able to take that money, we classify this as an asset and not an expense. So under current assets, we're going to have petty cash, and that is Four zero six three. Right. Okay, next one. We've got cell phone expense. So what does that mean? That means that your monthly cell phone subscription. That's not the handset that you use. That is your Vodacom or MTN or whoever monthly subscription for the usage of the phone. That's got a debit balance. So that means we are looking at those two classifications. So on those two classifications, let's see, will I in future receive value because of that subscription? Will they pay me the money back? Will I be able to use it for more than a year? The answer is no. When I pay my month subscription, I use it that month and I will never get the money back. So cell phone expense, you can add as a expense in my income statement. Okay, so just if it's not clear enough yet, if you classify something as an asset or a liability, it goes into the balance sheet. If you classify something as either income or expense, you allocate it to the income statement. Right, next one, computer equipment. This has got a debit balance of 10,000 Rand, which means we are looking at those two classifications over there, asset or expense. Will I be able to use a computer for more than 12 months? And the answer is yes. Most likely I will be able to use this computer for three or more years. So that means it's an asset and I'm going to classify that as a non-current asset. Therefore, computer equipment, non-current assets. And the value was 10,000 Rand. Okay, now we've got installment sale creditor. We can actually look at these two lines together. So that means I've bought a motor vehicle 
and I've allocated, well, I show that as a debit, but I've bought that through finance, through West Bank or NFC or one of those guys. So because of that, I have a future liability towards them. So let's start with the motor vehicle. That's the easy one. It's a debit balance. So it's either asset or expense. Will I use up that full motor vehicle in one month? The answer is no. So it can't be expense. It has to be an asset. Is it a trading asset? Will I be moving motor vehicles on a monthly basis and on the next day and the next week? My answer is no, it's one vehicle and I will use it for more than 12 months. So for that reason, motor vehicle gets allocated to non-current assets. And then let's think about the installment sale creditor. Will I pay this entire installment credit uh, installment sale credit uh, in the next 12 months? And the answer is no. I'm going to take this over four or five years. So in practice, well, let's start. In practice, a portion will be paid this year because you start paying this year, but you are going to pay for five years. So in practice, you will actually split this and show the portion paid in the next 12 months as a current liability and the remaining portion as a non-current liability. But for this training example, I just want to get the idea. So I'm just going to classify the whole thing as a non-current liability so that you can understand that once you have to pay something off for a whole number of years, that means it's a non-current liability. Right, so that's those two done. So now we get to printing and stationery. So this will now be all of your paper that you buy and your uh, Minolta subscription for your printer, rental, all of these type of things. It's got a debit balance, which means it's either an asset or an expense. And because it's not of a material value, pieces of paper, something like that, we're not going to show, yes, we will use that paper throughout the next month, but in general, that will be used up within the month or within the next 12 months. So because of that, we will show this as a expense. So printing and stationery will be expense of 3,000 Rand. Then we have professional fees. So now the, these are the fees that we've generated for doing or by doing work for clients. And that's got a credit balance of 50,000 Rand. So that means we are looking at one of those two classifications over there. It's either a liability or it's income. So when I do work for clients and they pay me for that, will I have to pay the money back? The answer is no, I can keep it. So the moment I can keep the money, we can enter a line under income. Now you can see after I've entered that line, suddenly now we've managed to make a profit. Right, let's move on. So now we get to these two, our rent expense and our rental deposit, which we've dealt with a few times now. So this one should be easy. So let's first look. Rent expense has got a debit balance of 7,000. So that means it's got a classification, either asset or expense. After I've paid my rent, my use of the office for the month, will the landlord give it back to me or will I receive long-term value from that? answer is no, I'll rent the office for that month and then the money is gone, I'll never see it again. So for that reason, rent expense will be classified as a expense. And the rental deposit, that's also a debit, so it means we're looking at those two classifications there. So let's ask ourselves, once we pay the rental deposit to our landlord, Will we receive it back in future? And the answer is most probably yes. The moment that lease of mine expires, the landlord will pay that money back to me. So the moment someone will pay me money in future, that means it's an asset. Now in practice, we classify all our deposits that we pay as current, uh, current assets for the reason that your lease will have an expiry, well, uh, 
termination clause. So if we terminate our lease, we'll probably have to be there for another month or two. But after that, we can get access to this fund. So we always want to show our business to be as liquid as possible, to have as much current assets on hand as possible. So rental deposits we will classify as a current asset of 7,000 rand. Right, then we get to salaries. Salaries has got a debit balance, so it means it's either an asset or an expense. So when my staff do work for me and I pay them on the 25th of the month, will they give the money back to me? Definitely not. So salaries and wages will be an expense of 20,000 rand. Right, then we get to business creditor ABC stationers. That's got a credit balance of 3,000 Rand. So that means it's either a liability or income. Now, in this case, these are our stationary suppliers where we buy our stationery from, and they've delivered our stationery, but we haven't paid them yet. Now, if we know we have to pay someone in future, what will the classification be, income or liability? And the answer is definitely liability. Now your stationary supplier, if your terms were that you only have to pay them next year for the stationary that they deliver, then it would be fine to classify them as a non-current liability. But in this case, this is a current liability because most likely I will have to pay this in the next month. Okay, then we get to business data client A. And that's got a debit balance of 10920. So that means it's either an asset or an expense. So a business debtor client A, that means we've done work for this client, we've invoiced him, but he hasn't yet paid us. So what happens in that case? It means in future, this client will have to physically pay us. And what happens the moment a client has to pay you in future? That means we have generated a asset so under current assets why current asset because you're hoping that this client will at least pay us in the next 12 months hopefully they'll pay us in the next month so for that reason it's a current asset we will in future receive money and then the last one says uif and paye owed to sars 960 rand on the credit side so that means I have a classification of either a liability or income. Now let's think what happens when we pay our salaries on the 25th of the month, we deduct the PAYE and the UIF off of our staff members. But do we then get to keep it? If the answer was yes, then we would have generated income. But the answer is no, we have to pay that over to SARS by the 7th of the next month. So therefore, UIF and PAYE will be a current liability because we will have to settle that in the next month, not in more than 12 months. Right, so now let's check. Now we see, oh, we've got a problem. Our balance sheet isn't balancing. Why is that? What's the missing leg? Is equity. So what did we say when we originally did our uh, equation to say assets equal equity plus liabilities? When we listed all the assets and the liabilities, what did we list under equity? We said that is all of our income and expenses. So where do we get the total of our income and expenses? That's simple. That comes from my income statement. And that line item we will call retained income. That means that is the income that we've generated and that I'm keeping for myself as the shareholder. And now my balance sheet balances. So let's just check. So going back to our lecture, the income statement is the history. That showed us how much work we did. It showed us which expenses we incurred. My assets will tell me what will happen in future. I will have computer equipment and a motor vehicle that I can sell for 10 and 30 grand, put the money in the bank and take that. 
My petty cash, the shareholder can take. My rental deposit will be paid into my bank account and the shareholder can take that. So this is basically telling me what, how much money I will still receive in future. The liability sections will tell me how much of those funds I will have to physically pay out. So if I take out the equity portion, you'll see the equity actually means what I'm getting in in future, less what I'm getting out in future. And that is my equity. Okay, so hopefully that will shed some light on financial statements and help you guys when you are consulting to work through financial statements and be able to understand that a little bit better. But again, as a closing comment, this is not in the assignment at all. This we did for real life and I believe for your business plan. You will have to have a balance sheet and a income statement. Okay, so the next lecture that you guys will be getting will be an overview or a quick run through of the assignment.